Let's welcome in our co-hosts on this fabulous Friday morning. Uh, the last of uh, Friday morning of Eastern Standard Time. Remember, Saturday night into Sunday, you set your clock ahead one hour. Fallback spring ahead. That's how you remember that, Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Once again, you probably saved me an embarrassment because I would have not have set my watch ahead except you'd be reminding me again. Just you do good. Just would have met you, you were early for your oatmeal. That's all. <laughs> Let's welcome in New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, who just got a haircut at the Republican barbershop in town the other day. I did, John. I did. And you know what? When I'm elected king, we're going to have one time. That's it. We're not going to do spring forward, fall back. We're just going to live with... Yeah, I'm not sure why we keep doing when, I don't, I don't yeah. get it. All it does no. is it, it makes it difficult. You yeah. know, you go for a week of not knowing what time it is. Oh, you're just worn out, you know? Yeah. yeah you're going to be elected or be appointed? Appoint, I don't think you get elected yourself. king. I don't either, but John will try. Yeah. But you I'm know, not sure he could be elected. He could be appointed. I write books. I can make up words. <laughs> I can do whatever I want. In my little world, I own it all. I don't think so. I think kings take the chair by power, yeah. by force. Yeah. I don't think they get elected or Do you appointed. really want me to have to do that? No. I can. No, I, he's too nice a guy uh, to not. take it by power. I'm just curious to see how you get elected king. Like, I want to yeah. know that process. <laughs> I think y'all are thinking way too hard on this. I'm just saying. You said when you're elected king. I did, you're the guy that said words matter. We had a conversation in this studio not long ago, and you said words matter. Uh, didn't Bill Clinton teach us that, too? I did not. <laughs> oh, God. Let's welcome in Chris Miller. He's a candidate for governor. Good morning, sir. Thank you for having me on, gentlemen. I was given by uh, Judy Boykin, who supplies me with that which she would otherwise recycle eventually. Uh, a four-page Chris Miller mailer that went out, which actually has about eight pages of stuff to it, too. One of these photos, you are flashing the guns, my man. Flashing the guns. Look, at you doing some biceps that week, some curls. If you pay really close attention to one of them is still uh, not connected to the lower part of the uh, elbow because I had a f my last official sanctioned fight was in Gleason's gym in August of 22. And in the first round, my bicep tendon popped. And yeah. bicep rolled yeah. up into my yeah. shoulder. And one of the hardest things I've ever done is to keep fighting through something like that yeah. and still won the fight. Um, it was very, very hard and had surgery afterwards. And it just is not the same as it used to be. See, when you said we'd see that the, it wasn't attached, that you were telling us it was Photoshopped. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it, it's like you can see the distance between where the bicep's supposed yeah. to connect and then where the elbow is. There's like a gap there. So I've got my left arm isn't quite what it used to be. That sounds like that would hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't feel good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're all admired people that keep finishing what they started. But why would you continue to fight in that I, particular fight? I don't have quit in me. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I just don't have that in me. And, you know, my wife sitting right here beside me, she'll probably tell you the same thing. I, we, we, we all get hit with certain gifts yeah. and certain weaknesses, yeah. too. Right. And um, that 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 relentless energy yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, is something that I've always had with me, and it's just the way that it is. But it also, uh, um, it's one of the reasons why I'm sober today, yeah. because that same you know manic focus sure. on things can yeah. cause problems. So, um, you know, we're all a little different, and mine is I got hit with a bunch of energy, and I just don't like to do things that <laughs> quick. The wife is Cassie, by the way, and yes, you want to lean in real quick and wave hello, Cassie, uh, to your right, scoots to your right a little bit, because then you'll get on camera. And every oh, there you go, there's there's Miss Cassie. <laughs> Uh, you can relax now. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. But he did mention your name, so. That, and your sleeve was in the photo, so. It was in the shot. That's my buddy right there. We've been married since uh, 2003. We ran off and Congrats. got married, didn't tell anybody, and uh, uh, took off to New York City. Um, had Scott, the security guard, as our witness, and got married at the courthouse in New York and had a fantastic uh, time together. And um, everybody thought we were crazy. And. Mm -hmm. Over 20 years later, here we are. Did so. you um, meet in high school or something? No. She. Uh, the true story is she rented an apartment from my mom, and my mom met her and went, she may be able to tolerate my son, <laughs> and introduced us. Yeah. And we always had a connection and stayed in touch through college. Yeah. And then I was living in Columbus, Ohio, and she was doing student teaching in Huntington, and I convinced her to come up and visit me one weekend in Columbus, and the rest is history. Just we started dating in December, bought our rings in February, and eloped in May. It was wham, wham, wham. Wow. Yeah. So the old adage, "Mom's no best," actually is true. Yeah. Although I, total, total uh, full disclosure, I hurt my mom's feelings running off and getting married because she didn't get to walk me down the aisle. Yeah. Yeah. And in my mind, being well, young, yeah. dumb, and in love, yeah. you know, we were running off to get married. I did not think that. Wait a minute. 
this would be something really, really important yeah. for my mom to do. Now, for the ones you're my son, I'd be annoyed at you too, right? Yeah, now. right. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. For the ones that do not know who your mom is, do you want to introduce her very quickly? I, my my mom's in Congress. Her name's Carol Miller. Um, she served West Virginia in Congress since 2018. Um, and you know, she, she's a, she's a woman of service. She's not boisterous and out front looking for Twitter headlines. She gets in there and does work and yeah. she's actually the, uh, on ways and means right now, which is very, very difficult yeah. to get onto, especially in your second term in Congress. Yeah. And she was able to do that. Um, you know, she, she's, uh, uh that's mama, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and everybody has a connection with their mom. Yeah. Um, they're the ones that raise us. And mama's mama, and I'm awful biased. <laughs> Do you think is that more than norm in in Congress that the, the folks who are not on Twitter constantly that, that are actually doing the work of the people and trying to get stuff done as opposed to always being on the news yeah. and always kind of ruining the news cycle? Because I got to tell you, it, it's discouraging to 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 see the news cycle, and it's encouraging to hear that there are people that are just getting the work done. Is that is that mostly the norm, do you that's, think? That's very accurate. There's a fraction in there. There's people that put their heads down and work and realize that they're there to serve people. And then there's other people that like to make Twitter headlines. And, and uh, um, that's the problem with politics nowadays. It's about sensationalism, right? It's, it's not about actually dialing into issues. And, you know, one of the things that's really, really important to me is what I've done with my business career. Started out, when I got involved in our family's business, we had two. And through two, a lot, two, what, two businesses, um, real estate company, car dealership, and through a lot of hard work and blood, sweat, and tears, I turned it into 26 different enterprises. Um, we have 700 employees, 500 of which are in West Virginia. And we're in the automotive space, obviously, insurance and reinsurance, real estate. I've got a bison farm, and then I've got a data and technology company. And I, if I ran our businesses the way the government spends our tax dollars, I'd be broke. And I think the relationship that we all look at is a little skewed because all of us here in this room and everybody here listening, we're all taxpayers. And the way to look at this from my perspective is we should all be looked at as shareholders. And the state government should be run more like a business and provide a tangible return on investment to all of us taxpayers and to look at us as valued shareholders and valued customers and do everything that they can with a single-minded focus to enrich lives and provide a return on investment and value. And that's the relationship that I think is upside down because it's so darn easy to spend other people's money and not do a very good job of it. And it just kind of happens over and over and over again in just about every single entity you can think of. And it, that's one of the things that drives me nuts because it's backwards. It really is. Yeah, we kind of broached on this the last time you were on, Chris. Uh, it's awful easy to say we're going to reduce our spending. Uh, and I hear candidates say that all the time. Do you have some specific ideas how you would go about identifying where legitimate cuts can be made? Yeah, um, great question. So one of the things that I've done with my business career is I've identified businesses that could be great businesses and realized they weren't being run right and gone in, evaluated them, and then literally bought them and turned them. And that's how I've made my business career. And you can do the same thing with the government. You just look at the structure, you look at the inefficiencies, you find the leverages for technology that you can implement to find efficiencies. And you, I mean, you can do this agency by agency by agency. Let me give you an example. So all of the different businesses that we have, I have a software system that actually analyzes everything, closes tickets in real time, merges all the customer data and all of the accounting data into a dashboard to let me manage on a broad level. And I can click and dial into every single account all the way down to journal entries. And like it allows me to be very, very efficient. We do not have anything like that running our state government. We do not have any software system that unifies all the different agencies, tracks key performance indicators, closes tickets in real time, and merges data into a dashboard to let the legislative branch and the executive branch manage. That's just one of the many examples. So I, uh, artificial intelligence is becoming kind of the buzzword these days with a degree of optimism and also a degree of nervousness, skepticism. Skepticism. Could you see AI being more aggressively utilized in the federal government, in state government? Absolutely, um, except for that AI that has all that woke stuff kind of pre-programmed into it. I don't know if you've looked up that or not, but you, it, it's funny how uh, a lot of these social issues get wired into the technology, and it makes zero sense because technology isn't supposed to be anything 
anything but actual analysis of data and regurgitation of facts. And the way they've programmed a lot of this AI is that it's skewed based on a lot of this DEI stuff, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that makes zero sense there at all. Kim Commando's uh, program, which we air the features from it, was talking about that because with that pre-programmed, you wind up with black Nazis. Uh, <laughs> In, in pictures, right? Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Uh, it was one of the things that uh, they had to go back and reprogram what they were doing and, because it's not historically accurate to have black Nazis. Yeah. Uh, and this is one of the fascinating things to me, too, because uh, that data company that I started in March of 2020, it's taught us a lot. And we're in the beginning stages of a demographic shift in the country. And as it turns out, like if you look at the sequence of events, here's a shocker. People are sick and tired of all this wokeism being shoved down their throats inside of school systems. They're also kind of sick and tired of, of the opiate epidemic and all of the people in backpacks running around the street. And they're tired of like this, this crime uptick that's happening all around the country, in particular in large cities. And when we locked them all down in urban areas surrounded by concrete and they couldn't go to church, they couldn't see their friends and family, they, they, they couldn't get their hair cut, go see comedy shows. It literally was the icing on the cake that started forcing a lot of this movement. And West Virginia has what people are looking for all around the country. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I, it's my understanding that the crime has ta is actually somewhat reduced uh, now than what it was a few years ago, both in the cities and nationwide. So there's a reporting issue there, and I'm glad you brought that up, because one of the things that you're seeing in a lot of the liberal cities is they're saying, don't arrest people, don't do that, don't do that. And all the while, we're seeing videos of people going in and actually burglarizing, you know, what. Uh, CVS stores, um, you know, uh, the stealing of cell phones in Apple stores, like that's happening everywhere. And nobody's getting arrested or getting in trouble. And so the actual the crimes are still continuing to occur. Trespassing, um, you know, B&E, vandalism. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff with your drug use, right, out in the open. And they're not doing anything. That's the direction that mayors are giving to police departments. And we're actually seeing this in West Virginia, too. There's a couple of towns in West Virginia that have this thing going on. One of them, my hometown. You know, when, when you're told not to go arrest criminals or, 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 or drug addicts that are causing problems inside of a city and it's messing up commerce because it's all happening downtown, then that's a problem. Now, that's, that's quite disturbing. Is how, how well documented is that statement? Uh, a lot of it is intuition and observation from like common sense perspective. Okay. So it's not something that's publicly released in a newspaper, but the communication and police departments will tell you that as well. Communication from mayor's offices to police departments are, you know, we can't do that. No, 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 don't do that. And it's happening in all these big cities all around the country. Hey, wanna, uh, Chris, do you have to get anywhere anytime soon this morning? Ah. Uh, we, we're having some problems with our stream in the first part of our uh, segment here, so I'm going to keep you a little longer, if you don't mind. No problem. Sounds past great. 830. John, go right ahead. <clears throat> Campaigning is all about emotions and, and uh, sort of uh, addressing the frustrations that people have. Governance is about programs to specifically address those frustrations. So when we get to the specific, one of the things that really concerns me about West Virginia, being a relative newcomer to the state, is the foster care issue here. The, the outrageous number of, of children who, not homeless, but are in the foster care system. <clears throat> and from what I can tell, Nobody seems to know who's in charge of the program, and nobody really seems to know what string to pull in order to fix the program. And people want to throw money at the program, but they're not sure where to throw it. So what is your, where do you go? What's the first thing you do to start addressing this? I've been a very, very heavy contributor and also volunteer for the Children's Home Society of West Virginia, which is a staging ground for the foster care system all around the state. You know, when kids are removed from homes, they have to have somewhere to go before they're actually placed in, you know, somewhere. And this is a nonprofit organization that does an incredible job, and they're the first it, people that we would lean on. Is this a thing that I would call an orphanage? In, in, in sure, politic terms? Sure, absolutely. Um, you, you can call it that. It's a uh, um, staging ground to be placed into foster care. Um, it, so technically not really an orphanage, but it's the same thing, right? right? And one of the shocking things that I've learned is, you know, you look at the height of opiate use. 2017 was the height of the opiate epidemic. And now all those kids are turning six and seven years old and they're moving into first grade. And we're not really prepared, prepared for it all around the state of West Virginia. And a lot of these teachers are not prepared for it. And we also have a teacher shortage nationally. 
And if we're going to actually fix West Virginia and grow an economy and create an economy that thrives and go through and start running government more like a business, then we have to make sure that we have an education system that keeps people here. And so education is actually really, really important when it matches up to doing what the big job is, which is running an economy. And there's going to have to be a lot of focus of that. And it, it, it literally overlaps with the foster care system issue because you got a lot of kids because of what's happened with the opiate epidemic and because of what's happened with fentanyl. You get a lot of kids that are born addicted and they're moving into an age where they're going into school and these teachers are not prepared to handle them at all. I mean, it is a bad scenario. And aside from that, we still have an obligation for every single taxpayer around the state to provide a quality product with education, which we do not. Um, you know, we're, we're basically dead last in education. I don't know if you guys saw some of the test scores that are happening up here as well, but it's all around the state. It's mm -hmm. pretty bad. So how do you fix it? So, <clears throat> you were about to say yeah, something. I was going, I was going yeah. to add to it. I, uh, education, a lot of it comes back to teacher salaries. Uh, oh, yeah. our, we're a border county, and Maryland's going to be increasing their salaries significantly. We're already behind. Virginia's way ahead of us, and I assume the same thing is true in the western part of the state. We've got to get serious about paying the teachers. Hallelujah. Absolutely. We have to pay our teachers more, and there's room in the budget to do it. Part of the problem is, is that you got this big bloat of bureaucracy that soaks up all the resources before it flows into the classroom to pay the teachers more because they're dealing with more stuff than they've ever dealt with, and there's a teacher shortage, and also to realize that resources should always flow to who the customer is, and the customer, which is the taxpayer, is the student and the parent. And so but bloated waste that kind of soaks up resources before it makes it into the classroom to pay our teachers more. And that is a major issue. So absolutely, they leave here and they go to Maryland and get a teaching job. Going to they do leave more now yeah. with Maryland's new uh, pay yeah. scale. They go to D.C. for teaching jobs. They go to Virginia for teaching jobs. We need to keep our best teachers here. And the way to do that is to make sure and pay them more. And there's room in the budget. You just got to figure out how to squeeze it out the right way. Is it time to abandon the flatline budget? Uh, I would say that it needs to be looked at significantly. The other thing that doesn't happen is, is that there is no reward in place at all for bureaucrats to save us money. So they get a budget and then they have to spend everything before then they go back the next year to ask for more money and they always ask for more. And there's no incentive for them to go like, we were allocated $40 million and we actually operated and thrived on $31 million. We saved the taxpayer $9 million. There's no incentive there for that. There's what, no what would the incentive be? What would you change? Uh, that's a great question. Legally, there's some you know tweaks you got to make, but really there should be some sort of reward that pays everybody in that particular that department and everybody, right? Because if you've got people that are clerks shuffling paper, they need to be just as motivated to save money as you do the people that are running the thing. And so it should be with everybody. In Efficiency so bonuses is Bingo. what you're saying, right? Yeah. Is that legal under the current uh, pay scale? Not quite. Um, the other thing that we do need to look at, that's that software system that I was talking about using to manage, you can use that to actually track the performance of people and how well they do. And we need to make sure any job that you're in, if you're not rewarded for being a good worker, uh, does it breeds complacency, and then there's no incentive to actually go do the job better. And so we need to integrate a lot of that into it. Can the governors in the state uh, make a change to that effect where you can do efficiency bonuses, uh, think, or does it have to go through the legislature? I think it has to go through the legislature, but you can when you're working together, and that's the other thing, if you want to accomplish great things, you have to work together. You have to work with the legislature. You have to work with the House. You have to work with the Senate. You have to make sure and understand what's on the minds of everybody there and then what's on the minds of all of the people because the governor's job is the CEO of the state, and his job is to report to the taxpayer. And so he needs to understand all that stuff, and then he needs to report to the taxpayer about what they're doing. Chris, so, I'm sorry, sir. No, you're, right. uh, you're not as well known in the uh, eastern panhandles as you are in the southern part of the state. One way that you're going to endear yourself to everybody would be locality pay. We uh, talked about that a little bit. Would you? A thousand percent support that. It is a market-based function, and the market should determine what people are paid. And if you actually want to be competitive and you're in a market that's different, then you have to have the ability to adapt. That is a necessity. Local pay is a necessity, especially for the Eastern Panhandle, because guys, this section right here is going to be one of the keys to not only fixing and saving the state, but it's going to be a key to a lot of the economic growth that we're going to go through. And that's the other thing that I've noticed going around the state and talking to everybody. 
there's kind of this common ground is that there's this good old boy system that's been running our state for too long. And if you could talk to the people in the northern panhandle, they're like, we think all the resources go over here and then to Charleston. And if you go to the south, they go, we think all the resources go up north and then to Charleston. And you go to the eastern panhandle, everybody thinks all the resources go you know, to the south and then to Charleston. And that's the common denominator. We're talking about an area that doesn't produce as much anywhere and too many of the resources. We need to make sure the resources go to the right places. And the Eastern Panhandle, I don't think, gets a representation of the amount of economic growth that it has in relation to the amount of resources that it gets. So we got to fix that statewide, in my opinion. One of the resources we need here is a widening of Route 9, or at least some type of Route 9 bypass if you're trying to get through Hedgesville on the way to Berkeley Springs. At the wrong time of the day, and most of the day is the wrong time of the day. It's tough. <laughs> yeah, we, it's we, a nightmare, and we have we we're, we're not. I I'll, t- I'll get, tell you this, Chris, real quick. In my email every day, I get a delivery from the Department of Highways bragging about how many potholes they're fixing around the state. To this point, not one of it lists every county where they're doing work. Not one of those emails has had Berkeley or Jefferson County in it in terms of the potholes we're fixing around the state. And that would be fine if there was at least a broader scope of what this area needs to keep up with the growth that we're getting. And that would be help for Route 9. And we're being told that there's just nothing in the near future. And by near, I mean like the next five to 10 years about Route 9. So there should be, but you want to know the truth? Our Department of Highways is not really one really well. And we're already bonded to the gizzards when it comes to what we can actually use for money because the road bonds project, which is a big bond, we're only going to be able to finish about two thirds of it from the time that was passed versus now you have increasing labor costs, higher interest rates and inflation. And that means we're only going to be able to finish about three quarters. I've been saying two thirds. It looks like it might be three quarters of the overall road bonds project. And the only way that we're going to be able to fund roads in the future is through general revenue until that bond gets kind of cleaned up over time. So we're gonna have to get really smart and really creative and we have to get our best and our brightest involved to help make sure that we're able to build roads with the amount of money that we've got as we continue to grow the economy, which grows the tax revenue, to be able to offset it. Now, what, when, when, hold on there, Bill. Okay, yeah. Now, when uh, Jim Justice ran for governor, he ran as, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. I know how to grow this state. And the first year, and the proposed tax increase obviously didn't go over too well. but. The state has grown economically, and the revenues have grown as has he has continued his two terms as governor. Basically, you're asking the people of the state to do the same thing. I'm a businessman. I know how business works. I can help grow the state. I'm not a politician. Great. I'm glad you brought that up. So I can address me as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, I will work tirelessly for the people of West Virginia. Um, I am a business guy. That's where I've made my money, and it allows me to see things a little differently than politicians and bureaucrats do. And that vision that allows you to understand what a real marketplace is, is what allows you to actually solve problems and fix and improve things. There's a lot of waste that needs cleaned up. We do need to focus on revenue generation, but the revenue generation shouldn't be through taxation. It should be through economic growth that brings everything up. So that business guy perspective is a very, very valuable thing. The difference between me and everybody else is, is that I will work 70 hours a week. I will be there on the ground in Charleston and then traveling all around the state all the time to make sure and understand everything that's happening, to put in all of the effort to provide the taxpayers with the product that they deserve. Republicans have dominated the legislature for the last what is it 10 years now i think since they took Close. over control of the the house and the senate it's about right and they have made changes to make the state more business friendly what else needs to happen you're a businessman you deal with the taxes every day of your business and what it takes to get a business up and moving in this state what do you need to, to improve three of the four fastest growing states post pandemic are tennessee texas and florida and they all have one thing in common that is a zero state income tax And that is one of the first things I like to accomplish and get done. Um, Capital flows like water to the places that it's most welcome. And getting rid of the income tax is definitely a people driver because it used to be when you were in a high tax state, you were able to deduct all your state level taxes from your federal ticket before you sent your check in. Well, the rates went down, but those deductions went away, the SALT deductions. And so it makes it even more valuable for states with a zero state income tax to attract and recruit people and talent and capital and money because that zero state income tax is very very effective yeah admittedly we do we those three uh have uh no income tax but they have something that we do not have they have orlando they have a nashville they have the opera center they have uh uh 
Austin, several other, they have major attractions that we in West Virginia do not have. So isn't it oversimplistic to say the only thing that we have, we'll have in common will be the uh, uh, income tax? So West Virginia has two things that everybody else needs and wants. Aside from being geographically located a stone's throw away from two-thirds of the country's population, we have a high quality of life, we have a low cost of living, Based on data out there, people are looking for more of a family, conservative-based type of mindset, which is West Virginia. And also, we have an incredible amount of energy. We have the ability to produce an incredible amount of energy that no one else can. All the coal, all the natural gas. We, according to the Department of Energy, there's more geothermal heat in West Virginia than any other state in the country. But All. Chris, we're, <clears throat> we're first in addiction. We're last in education. We're, that's, we're, we're first in grandparents raising grandkids. There you go. So, and, and you want to, we want to develop all of this by reducing revenues into the state, right? So how does... You want to increase revenue by creating free market activity. But we want to attract people yeah. into an area that doesn't feel very attractive. It sounds like a fight worth fighting, doesn't it? It does sound like a fight yeah. worth fighting, but where, what's the first string to pull out of this? I, a lot of it is the incentive mechanism. One of the steps is the, the the state income tax. That is one of the first things. You've got to revamp that stuff, and then you've got to start like putting us in a position where we can produce an incredible amount of energy and export it and also use that to drive down the cost of power for our people. It's a cost function, right? Businesses will come to the places that they're most welcome from a capital perspective. As we grow technology, we're sitting here in a room full of all kinds of technology. You have to have the power to fuel it. You have to. As artificial intelligence, like you mentioned, keeps growing. You have to have power to fuel it. And the only power to fuel all of that is baseload power. Coal, natural gas, geothermal, water, I mean, nuclear, and that's West Virginia. So what we're talking about doing is we're not talking about solving six-month terms, six-month problems, or four-year election cycles. We're talking about creating an infrastructure that's going to solve a problem for 10 years down the road that then fixes us for 80 years moving forward. And that's the problem with politics. Four-year election cycles, constant changeover of people. You don't get any any sort of vision at all. You don't get any long-term planning. And you can't snap you know, your finger and fix this stuff in three months. It's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of vision and a lot of grinding and a really high energy level to get this stuff done. As we mentioned earlier, you're much better known in the southern part of the state than you are in the northern part of the state, the eastern panhandle. Do you think that your message has been, is getting out now? Yes, sir. It, it's crazy. It's happening. Even coming up here in the eastern panhandle, people are starting to see us, and they've seen us on the digital stuff and the direct mail stuff. Ah, you're that guy. You're that business guy from the Huntington. It's happening. It's happening all around the state. People are, like, tired of it. They want to run state government a bit more like a business. They do want to break up that good old boy system that's been running our state for far too long. They're tired of a lot of the wokeism and stuff in schools. They want to focus on good old fashioned values. They want to clean up the opiate epidemic and fix that. We still don't get rehabilitation right. There's an incredible amount of work to do. They're tired of our tax dollars being wasted. One of the things that really resonates with people is that we should be auditing every dime that we spend. And these are things that I've learned not only from traveling around the state, all around the state for the past 14 months, but actually 15 months, Jimmy many Christmas. Um, but it actually is cross-referenced with what you know people want through polling, too. So this is like real stuff. It really is. And people in West Virginia are looking for something different. They really are. And there's a chance where we could do something spectacular as a state. And I just don't see it's worth leaving up to politicians and bureaucrats and attorneys to pull off. Somewhere out there, I'm going to guess someone is saying a full-time politician isn't going to be distracted by 26 other businesses. Great what do you say to that? God, that's a great question. So um, the entire last six months of 2023, I spent restructuring our businesses. My brother stepped up and took over as president of the organization as we hired a chief operating officer that is a retired colonel from the military. And he's doing a fantastic job. We have a new corporate controller and we have a new CFO and that team is set up. I have not been involved in running our businesses this past year, aside from month in stuff, maybe four or five hours a week. When the time comes to actually walk in and represent the people in West Virginia, I will not be working on that business in any way, shape or form because my obligation and my job will be to make sure that the state of West Virginia is the best that it can be. And that's gonna take a lot of work and it wouldn't be fair for me to be distracted in any other way. Final question for Chris. 
That was it. Then the final word is yours, Chris Miller. God, thanks so much for having me. It's been an absolute blast, and I love coming up here and meeting all the people from the Eastern Panhandle. We're going to be around here uh, all day Friday, all day Saturday, speaking at a gala, the TCCA gala at the stables at Arden on Saturday evening. It'll be a fun time. And then heading back home after that, and I will be up here all the time moving forward, in particular up until May 14th, but then after that, This has to be a key for the future of West Virginia is the Eastern Panhandle. And there's an incredible amount of work and representation that needs to happen up here. And it's going to be an absolute pleasure to be a part of that. And I will tell you this, too. The people up here are really, really awesome. A bunch of great people. It's a little different than where I'm from, you know, the southern part of the state. you got a lot more influence from Maryland and from D.C. you got a lot of people that have been here in West Virginia as well for a long period of time, and they're great people. And this is a growing area. It's exciting to see all the development and the fun happening. Chris, have a great day. I appreciate you coming by. Thanks so much for having me. Ms. Cassie, thank you so much for coming in, too. Thank you.